The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for November 2022. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, the host of this wonderful show called What's Neat that we produce every month for the Model Railroad Hobby. And this month is a great show in that I share with you how to build trestles. We build Lightner trestle on the Rio Grande Southern in about an hour and six minutes from start to finish. I take you through the entire process of how to build this beautiful structure, which I will say is one of the most accurate models in HO scale of this bridge that has ever been built. I relied on photographs and drawings and everything that was at my disposal in order to nail this one. So I think you'll enjoy this month's how-to video on building Leitner Trestle this month on What's Neat. Also this month, Doug Blaine stops by and shared with us a lot of wonderful Christmas gift ideas. Bachman Industries produces and manufactures train sets in the Christmas theme and standalone products as well in HO scale, ON30, three rail O scale, G scale. All of it is to be seen because after all, it's almost Christmas and what a better gift than a train set for your favorite model railroader out there. I wanna say thank you very much to Lombard Hobbies for helping us promote this hobby. They are the hobby shop that can caters to the expert and the beginner with great prices. They don't have sales because they've got the best prices all year long. So check them out at LombardHobbies.com or you can visit them in Lombard, Illinois. It's an absolutely beautiful store and they would look forward to you walking in and saying you've heard about them on What's Neat. Be sure to check out the What's Neat This Week <laughs> video sorry, show really. podcast that we shoot every Saturday night, except for the last week of each month, where we bring you updated news with special guests, our regular podcast crew, and a lot of new products as they're introduced throughout each and every month. It's an amazing show to watch, What's Neat, on YouTube. And so with that, let's continue on with the rest of this November 2022, What's Neat. Hi, I'm Ken Patterson, and in this videotape, we're going to discuss the entire process of building a trestle for your model railroad from the ground up. For this example, I'm building a Leitner trestle. That was a trestle on the Rio Grande Southern Railroad at milepost uh, 160. It was actually bridge 160, milepost 150. Sometimes the trestle was referred to as Franklin trestle because it, it was right at the Franklin Junction where the Rio Grande Southern had a split to go up to the Boston or the Calumet mine. But this is a really cool structure worth building simply because in 1952 the highway department came through and put a highway right through the middle of the trestle. So it adds all the interests of having a road, having the trestle, having the creek, having the deciduous pine trees and the scenery that goes around it. This is all set up to make for a very interesting scene. So I'm designing the base of this layout out of eight layered sections of foam. I very carefully studied the topography of the location where Leitner Trestle is in order to carve the topography. And I carved all of this about nine months ago because this project was, was simply an assignment. This started out as a job where one of my accounts, Blackstone Models, requested that I do the famous shot that Mr. Richardson shot of the final Rio Grande Southern train going across Leitner Trestle and plowing snow. This is a very famous photograph. It's hanging up in the Denver Union Station. And Blackstone Models thought it would be really nice to represent their product 
pushing the snow across the top of Leitner Trestle. So I thought I could just throw it together very quickly, build a photo prop, and get their shot in less than a few days. What turned into a few days now is nine months into the project. It's been sitting in the garage for six months of that time, and I brought it out to create this video on building trestles, because there's a lot of important information that you're going to attain from this that you can use to build any trestle in any scale on your model railroad. Dimensionally, every trestle on the Rio Grande South Southern, all 143 bridges that they had, were all just a little bit different. And so on this project, I refer to the prototype photos to get my dimensions. On your bridges, you could refer to drawings that are in magazines. There's plenty in Narrow Gauge Gazette and prototype photos of the old logging industry where the authors of the magazines had the foresight to actually put in drawings for us for the benefit of us modelers. So dimensionally, you can get your drawings from that or you can just follow along in this video and I'm going to tell you exactly the size of these dimensions and you can literally just build this bridge on your layout after watching this video. Now to do this project, as I explained, I used a lot of foam. I've carved out, pre-carved out all the topography already so that it would match the bridge when it was put in place. Because it's very easy to get these measurements off of the prototype photos that are in the books by counting the stories and figuring out how tall they are. That really was the math to figure out the topography. After the trestle vents are built, you'll find that you'll probably have to come through and just do a minimal amount of fitting. Maybe take out an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch and then make everything blend in. That's your final carving. Each section of foam is 15 feet thick. They're two inches in actual measurement, but a scale HO 15 feet. So that allows us to figure out the topography a lot easier. There's eight sections of foam stacked up here. This entire diorama is now carved. It's gonna be painted with latex paint to seal everything. And I'm anticipating putting oak sides on the side of it to add firm firmness to the diorama so I don't get any flexing. So at this point for this video, I wanted you to see the foam in its pink state before it gets sealed. And we're going to go on now and learn how to build a jig to start building our trussel vents next. Now, in order to build the bridge deck, the top of the bridge, I'm relying on every single prototype photograph that I've got of Leitner trussel so that I can get this bridge to be perfect. I want the top deck. It's the most important part. It's the part the train runs on. So after I took the long ruler and I drew a 350 foot radius curve because I know that's the curve of the bridge. And then I drew a second line that represented the second, the outer edge of the track. So I drew a 350 foot radius and about a 358 foot radius in order to be able to lay out the bridge deck. And the bridge deck is simply the wood that we used spliced together to make the top rail of the bridge. And then we're gonna lay our railroad ties, our, de our bridge deck ties, right on top of this for the whole way, all the way through the span, because I've got it drawn out here on the wood. I've got where all the trusses are gonna be drawn on here, 16 foot on centers. And if you do the math, this bridge is 350 feet across at a radius of 350 foot. So there's a lot of dimensions here that are actually easy to remember on this. Now for the center span where the concrete, or where the uh, girders are gonna go, I've been using this microengineering 50 foot girder to help me represent my measurements. I've got the highway drawn on the plywood where it should be. And I've also drawn on here where the steel structures are gonna be that are going to hold up the uh, bridge deck. Now this bridge deck itself, I've experimented with different size lumbers so that when the bridge ties are on and I've got some microengineering switch ties that I'm gonna lay on the inside here, everything's gonna be flush. All the dimensions came out just messing around with wood and again, copying the prototype photographs to get this side rail to look just like the rail that you see here in this picture on the prototype shot. So everything's laid out, the math should work, this should just set right into place on the diorama because we know that the diorama is very close topography wise, as close as I can get it by measuring the height of each truss from the photographs. 
So that's where we're at right now. Now I'm just going to lay deck ties all the way across the top of this, glue them all down, and we should have a really nice bridge top ready to go. I'm using my HO NMRA uh, narrow gauge, HON3 gauge. I'm using the flange way section, which has got a center point on it. And I'm using that center point to find the center point on the bridge. I'm taking our small fine rail and I'm taping the rail down. You see all this blue tape holding it down at the center line. So that what I'll have to do now is lay the next rail right next to it, use my gauge, make sure the spacing's the same distance apart. And then we're going to take a drill and we're going to drill the holes to make it easier to spike so we don't damage the head. And then after the holes are drilled, I'm going to go through and punch in spikes all the way around until I get both rails in place. And then I need to put the guard rails on the outside. Those are the wooden rails that hold everything from sliding on the top sides. Those rails will follow the entire 350 foot bridge on both sides. And then I also need to put in a guard rail on the outside of the actual narrow gauge track. The Rio Grande Southern put their guard rails on the outside, unlike today's prototype that puts them on the inside. So therefore, in case the train would derail, it wouldn't completely, the theory was, roll off the bridge. It would get caught up in those rails and keep guided into the center line of the bridge rather than going to the side and falling down, as many, as many did. So at that point, once all those tasks are done, we'll be able to test fit this onto our bridge and make sure all the math, which I'm sure it will match, will match up to our topography. Okay, I haven't finished the bridge top yet, but I took out the bridge off the piece of plywood just to do a test fitting on the diorama to make sure everything fit just right, to make sure that the highway overpass matched where the overpass and the road are. And I built my 1% grade into the trestle. It's going to be four feet higher on this side than it is on the other side. I'm using a grade percentage of grade level here to double check my work and that is reading one percent so now all I've got to do is build all the trestle bents and the cement foundations to fit appropriately across and match the photographs exactly and this thing should just simply fall together pretty much like a puzzle so let's just see how this turns out Now we're going to talk about building the jig, and that's the component that you use for putting the pieces of wood together in order to form your trestle and ensure that every one of your vents are exactly the same size. Again, I'm going to rely heavily now on this video on the Rio Grande story. And on this volume, this is volume three of the Rio Grande Southern story, and inside these books you're going to find great dimensional materials on what to use, size of boards and what have you, to build your trestle, and there's great plans in this book. Another great book that I found, Mallets on the Mendocino Coast, and that's the Casper Lumber Company book. And inside of there, they've also included really nice drawings of trestles and the bents. And the reason that's important is, and I'm going to get to that here in just a second, is that I used, in fact, this Narrow Gauge Gazette. And this is the issue from January and February of 1987. And it's got a real Grand Southern jig are bent drawn in it and the stories are correct for Leitner trestle with the 16 foot and 20 foot for the second story so what I wanted to do was build a jig using that photograph now I did this in large scale years back about 12 years ago I built this large jig and what this essentially was was where I built one bent first and then I lined small pieces of wood on either side of that bent to ensure that I could build the same bent over and over and then I used a staple gun and one inch staples and I went through the process of building the trestle in the backyard which in large scale came out to be about five feet high and 20 feet long on a 10 foot radius curve and I went along and I stapled it and put it together and fastened it over a period of, I want to say, five days. It cost a hundred bucks to build it, twenty-five dollars in staples and, and fence pickets, just uh, seventy-five dollars in fence pickets and you had a bridge for under a hundred bucks. So with that, which came out really nice, with that we're going to use the same principle for in the HO scale, trestle. So here's a drawing out of the Narrow Gauge Gazette. And essentially what I did was I took that drawing and I laid on top of it a piece of plexiglass, okay? And the reason for that was, well, what I was gonna do is see through the plexiglass and with the paper attached to the back side of the plexiglass, I could lay out all my pieces of wood to build the very first bent. 
make sure everything matched exactly no magic here and then what I did was once I had the first trestle bent built I took small pieces of plexiglass that I cut up in the table saw at lengths and what I would do is I would glue the pieces of plexiglass on either side of each one of the 12 by 12 posts and what that would do is form a jig after repetitively doing it to the entire thing that came out and looked like this where I could repetitively build bents over and over. Now I'm gonna take this wood out and show you kind of what it, how it went together and the way it looks. I, pulled, I drilled holes on the back side of it so I could push out the bents. Here's a small one that I'm building right now for a small trestle. Now midway through this project, and I didn't know it, I found out that Black Bear Construction Company in fact makes jigs that are ready to go for us on the market. Now these are all laser cut. They come with a piece of plexiglass that's slidable to help you make your cuts just like what we're going to be doing with a, a straight edge. And this is a great way to get your sizes and dimensions so that you can get started on your trestle jig right away. And they make trestle jigs in a multitude of scales and various Rio Grande Southern trestles and regular Rio Grande West, uh, West, Western DR, GRD and W trestles. So it's, an, it's a thought now that I may not have built a jig. I might have just went with the pre-built ones for this project. But at this point, that's how, I, that's how I went about building the jigs for the trestle. And this is what the finished jig looks like. And what this is going to enable us to do is to seriously speed up the time that it takes to build a trestle bent. And all you simply do is once you get the jig built, we're gonna lay our 12 by 12 sticks in the jig and build our first story, our first section right here. And the way this is designed is I can cut all my 45 degree, all my various angle cuts that match the pattern of the trestle by simply laying a ruler across the top taking my saw and starting to cut right here along the cut lines that we've got predetermined by our pieces of plexiglass that design the jig. And now I'm going to cut this section right here perfectly square and these, these outside vents are getting cut at their appropriate angle. Very simple process all the way through, blow out my parts, and I can put in my top piece of wood here. Put it right in just like that. Everything mats up tight. The angles are cut. And now we've got our top section. Now I lay this bent across where the next cut, or this ruler across where the next cut's gonna be. Keep my bents tight to the top. Be able to cut right here where the bottom foundations bent is going to go. And I'm cutting all four sticks of wood at the same time. The outside sticks are getting the angle cut on them. Two center sticks are being cut square completely by the jig and the saw. I cut all the way through here. piece in here where it's going to go. Spin the jig around a little bit. And we can cut this bent to the size that we need. And now we've built our first story. That's this section right here. And then to build the second story, which I'm going to take down to right here. If it were a half story, I've got the jig designed with the cross cut lines to do a half of a story. But in this case, I'm gonna do another full story down. This would be a full section. And I need to add two more stringers, two more. Um, these are gonna go in right here, and right here, because the second story of a Rio Grande Southern trestle has got the additional angled stringers here. So I've got a total of six 12 by 12 posts. And I want to cut right here across just like we did before so that these two angled stringers have the appropriate angle so they'll fit flush. So again, the, 
jig is helping me cut these pieces right here with the appropriate angles. Let me double check my work right here, make sure I'm doing that right. And I am, yes. I'm going to cut it right here. We lay our piece in here already pre-cut everything's perfect so far the jig is doing its job look how fast this is going just a few minutes to build an entire trestle bend as opposed to the very first bent that I built that took almost an hour because we were hand laying those pieces of wood over the top of the drawing now I'm cutting six pieces of wood here four of them are getting their angles cut on them the two center straight pieces are getting cut completely square. Just as easy as can be. We've got our next piece of wood to cross right here. It lays right in the jig. And I'm able to cut the sides off perfectly by lining it up and just cutting it. This jig saves time. Now these jigs you can buy commercially. You can buy them on the internet. Various sizes, various types of trestles. Of the 167 miles of main line that the Rio Grande Southern had, they had 143 bridges. And not one bridge was built exactly the same. Every bridge, every trestle had different variants in it. Now I'm going to cut this one right here. And this will finish out the bottom of our trestle bent. All six pieces of wood are going to get cut right here. And this is how the jig helps us. We could have never done this individually by hand this quickly. Make sure I'm getting this perfect here. like that. essentially built a complete bent. In this case it's exactly the height that I need to fit onto the diorama where it should fit. And then you just use the jig and lay your cross braces on like this where they belong. And once everything's dry you just simply lift the whole trestle section out of the jig and you're complete. The job is done. I'm using Elmer's exterior wood glue to glue this together. It's the strongest glue that I found of the interiors, exteriors, all the different brands. I tried the Gorilla glue on this and the best glue that I found that accepts the stain very readily is this Elmer's exterior glue. And you just simply take the parts and we're going to use the jig to glue it together. I dip the parts in glue, take out each part, dip them in glue. I'm also going to use a dental tool to apply the glue. I'm just dipping it in a little bit of glue on top of this Woodland Scenics, uh, Scenic Cement glue container. The lid works really well for that. Now for these ends, I'm going to dip my dental tool in. I just put a little bit of glue on each end of the stories. I want this to be as strong as I can, so I'm putting the glue on liberally and I can clean out the excess with a razor blade. The jig is holding everything in place while I glue it, so as it dries, we know that everything will be tight. I drop in this piece right here. The first story is now glued into position. I start the same process again on the upper boards. I start just dipping them in glue attaching them just like that. Everything's going in tight. 
This glue dries pretty nice, so it's not going to be obtuse. You're not going to see it. And we can scrape off any excess with a razor blade. See, this is just going together like a kit. Everything's pre-cut, everything fits tight because of the way we design this. Again, I'm gonna use my dental tool and I'm gonna come back and apply some more glue to the end of the next second story bottom here. And it's just ditto. You can sit here and watch TV, one eye on the model, the other eye on the TV. This is kind of mindless labor after you get used to the repetition. It goes very quick and you don't need to pay total attention to it. You can do other things while you're doing this which kind of makes it enjoyable. Now that's glued in tight and we just simply glue the bottom ones now. Same way. Dip them into glue. And everything goes together real nice. All six I've got glue. And then we'll put in the bottom piece. Glue the ends here. Each trestle end gets glued top and bottom. We want this to be as strong as we can. If this trestle takes one hit, the way it's designed with the sectional, it's gonna come apart as opposed to if this thing were just solid stringers like this all the way top to bottom with no breaks it would be a much stronger design the glue would be I would trust it so here we're gonna let this set now for about 20 minutes and then I've got holes on the back side of this so that after it sets up I take a needle or a pin or something or, or a nail and I can stick it through the holes and help have this whole thing come out nice and clean just a little bit at a time I'm really happy with this. We'll just let this sit up for about 20 minutes and and every bent that I'm designing, I'm designing off the pictures in the book to make sure they're exactly the same height as in the photographs. And so far it's matching up with the topography with, with very little carving, additional carving to make sure everything fits. It's working out really well right now. After each piece of wood is stained, I wipe them dry, wipe them down to get off the excess. Just like this. Each piece, just like this, gives a real nice color. Just like that. Now with the cross braces on the truss, it's easier, it adds strength. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a needle and I'm going to stick the needle underneath the main beams instead of using the push outs on the back and just simply lift this piece out of here so that I can lay it on a flat table surface and then attach the bottom. And what I'll do is I'll take dabs of glue and a dental pick and simply apply the glue to the bottom of each component including the side braces. Put this in a position and we'll wait 10 minutes and this will be dry and I'll put a cement foundation underneath this. And clean up the excess glue with my tool. Now I'm cutting the bent that's going to sit center right over the creek center. 
And so this bent will sit on top of stringers, joists that run across over the top of the creek. So this one's got to be cut to an absolute specific length to fit underneath the track and on top of the joists. And that's the cut that I'm making right now. After I've completed each bent, I have to represent the concrete foundation that the bents sit on top of. And for that, I'm using one eighth, and it's, in this case, I'm using two one eighth pieces uh, square put together. But usually, what I've been doing is taking a one eighth by one quarter inch stock and cutting that up. Some of the larger trestle bents at the very bottom of the creek bed have got almost two foot high sections of cement. So, in that case, I'm using a quarter inch by a three eighths inch stock. And that sets really nice for the cement foundations when it's all finished off. Paint it gray and then work it into the diorama, into the scene. Okay, after spending about 48 hours building nothing but trestle bents, I have built all the trestle bents now that are necessary to do the Leitner trestle project. And I've test fit, I've placed every one of the bents in its location, and all they're doing is simply setting there. They're not taped in, they're not glued in. The bridge top is simply sitting on top of the bents and holding them into place. And what I did was I used a hot foam cutter and I cut the final carving of each bent's placement. And then what I'll do is I'll remove the trestle and even flow out all the topography so that it matches. The only last thing that we've got to do is to build the center in this bridge. There's a center girder section where they put the highway right underneath the bridge back in, in the early 50s. And so what we're going to do is build the girder section out of microengineering 30-foot uh, girders, cut them up, make them fit to the bridge bottoms, and everything should line up just right with the girders that go from the ground up to the supporting under section of the bridge. So using the prototype photographs, again, heavily to model this part, I didn't bend, I did, I'm sorry, I did not make one trestle bent and place it without referring to these photographs. Every single bent is just a little different, even up to the cross bracing and where they place them, so that I could make sure that this model is completely as accurate as we can make it up to this point. Now the next thing that I've got to do, and this is something very important, and this is a decision that I've made midstream on the project, and that is this. This diorama is made out of multiple sections, about eight pieces of foam, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces of foam up and down. It's pretty thick, but at the center where the creek comes in, the foam is only four inches thick. And I'm seriously concerned that when this diorama gets transported in its condition now, if I build the bridge now, what'll happen is as the diorama gets lifted up, you get movement. You get a half an inch of movement. And what that that's not good. That'll flex, that'll torque the bridge. So the remedy, the cure for this is to wrap this diorama, which will eventually be a modular section for a layout in oak. So I'm gonna take the sides and I'm gonna take a router and we're gonna router out grooves in the sides of the entire diorama. I'm gonna have to shave it down, make sure the foam has got a perfect radius curve to it, and then I will put in the routered groove that we make on the diorama, one by twos. I'll trim them down so that they're absolutely flush with the exterior smooth surface, then I'll wrap oak plywood around by wetting the plywood first in water, and then fitting the curved sections, the preformed wet and curved sections of plywood onto this diorama. Now I've got an 11 foot curve around this edge on the outside, so I'm going to require one and a half sheets of plywood, probably 16 to 18 inches high, and 8 foot and a 4 foot section to be able to make that 11 foot wrap around curve. I'll stain the plywood black. I'll finish it with high gloss polyurethane, which will just allow the wood grains uh, relief to be seen. You won't see any actual wood grain because the black, you, you, there will be no brown tones at all. It will be completely black with wood grain as if it's a piece of stereo equipment. So at that point, then we're going to have, look at that, the trestle pieces fell down there, but we'll have a, a perfect surface to build our trestle on with no risk of flexing and destroying the bridge when we move the diorama. And that actually, upon that, finishing the road and finishing the top scenery, this, this thing will be finished. 
So let me work on the base, we'll get through that section, and then we'll glue the trestle in place. Before I can put the plywood sides on, I had to make sure that the sides of the diorama were completely square. And what that means is, is I ran the square all the way around, and I cut off in some areas almost a half an inch. And then I took my Stanley planer and I smoothed it all out smooth, and I did this all the way around the whole diorama. So that when the wood goes on there, the wood's going up and down smooth, and it's got a lot of surface for attachment. Okay, so everything's been routered out. You can see the router lines where I've cut all the grooves for the small blocks of wood to fit into. And now I'm painting and I'm sealing everything so that I don't get any, so I can slow down the rate of foam shrinkage. By sealing everything, the glue won't interfere with the foam on the exterior when we wrap the wood around. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to finish painting this whole diorama all the way around with latex paint and let it dry for about two hours. Now I've got blocks of wood, and they're all wet in a bowl. And that's the magic of using this Gorilla Glue, this polyurethane glue, is it expands around the block in the groove. When I place the block into the diorama, it expands and dries and holds it solid. So here I'm spraying the routered out crevice. And these are an inch and an eighth deep into the diorama. And they fit right in there just like that. I put the glue on three sides and you can also put a little bit on the end so that when they expand the foam will ooze through in between and literally make it like one piece of wood which will then attach the plywood to with staples. Pop, 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 pop. And this will give us a great surface to hold everything tight rather than just gluing it to the foam and then hoping someday the wood doesn't the curve doesn't come out expand and come apart this way it is just ensured that it'll stay tight on the diorama so, what I'm doing now is I'm cleaning up the dry polyurethane glue and this is what it looks like when it oozes out which means that it's very strong inside there. It's filled all the cavities. This wood's not going to move, and it's going to hold the plywood into position real nice. My plywood's been wet. It's easy to curve now, and I'm going to spray it with a water bottle and make it really wet. Apply some glue all over the inside after it's trimmed to the shape of the diorama. So just use the same Gorilla Glue to glue it into place. What I'm going to do now is make this all wet and just put the piece of plywood, wrap it right around and staple it in place and put all of our staples make sure they end up right where they belong and it's in the stiff wood that we put in the diorama. I'm taking a pen and I'm going to draw a line where I'm going to cut the plywood I'm going to draw the line just a little bit higher than what the scene is. Because I want to make sure that I've got enough edge for the dirt and the rock. And I'm figuring I'm going to have a quarter of an inch of added topography when I add the dirt and the rock. So I'm going to add just a quarter of an inch lip higher than the scene when I draw this line with this Sharpie. And then we'll take a bead trimmer and trim off the excess after we're finished. It's really important to leave an extra amount right where the water is going to go because we're going to fill this creek with Envirotex and I want to have a lip on the plywood to hold that like a dam. So that's all we're going to do is draw this line all the way around, all the way around here. I make everything wet. Now I'm going to put a lot of Gorilla Glue on this and then use a staple gun to staple staples right into the wood. So this will be attached with glue and with staples. So it's not going to move. I'm pretty positive this is not going to move. 
just like this. Now I'm putting on a black stain. I'm using Minwax Ebony Stain and I took two bottles of uh, HO Scale Flocal black paint and I used a lacquer based paint. I didn't use water based paint. And I mixed it in so that the ebony would have more of a black, blackish tone to it so that the wood grain would completely just be blackened. Now I have to put a second coat on this when it dries. And this is how nice it looks once you get the black stain, two coats of black stain put on the diorama. It gives a very professional finish. And now we'll put some coats, about three coats of polyurethane on this. And I'm going to sand between the second and third coat to make it glass smooth. And that'll finish off the outside frame of the diorama. There's going to be no more flexing on this model. So when we build the bridge, everything's going to be tight and nothing's going to get broken when the diorama gets moved. So now we've got a great base to build a beautiful scene on top of. I built Highway 160 that takes you onto Hesperus, Colorado, and I built this highway using pre-mixed concrete patch mix. And what I did was I put down wooden pieces of wood on each side to, to create forms, and then I, I took out the patching mix and I worked it in real carefully into the forms between the two, just working and blotting and tapping in the cement. And then using a water bottle, a spray bottle and water, I take a trowel and I can smooth over the top of the cement, giving you that road. Sometimes it's necessary to do two coats because the first coat shrinks just a little bit and you need a little more top coat on that in order to make it perfect. Then what I did in order to give the road color, I came through with some India ink and I liberally brushed on two coats of India ink on top of the cement that soaked into the cement that gave me that just that right color of black top that I wanted for the road. Now the first step of the scenery, now that the sides are done, is to spread the dirt and I use a screen to diffuse the dirt so I get an even spread on the scene. And then we'll go over this with rocks. I've got creek rock that I've sifted that is flint and it's got that that granite color to it. When we add the vegetation, we add the rock. This will have the characteristics of the western Colorado type scenery. Just like painting, painting with dirt. It's just like we're painting a scene with dirt. Now I'm referring heavily again on the photographs, and I'm I'm creating the rock bank on each side of the road, the shoulder on the road. And right now I'm using a lot of limestone, a little flint. It's got a lot of rust in it, a lot of iron in the stone, so it gives you that granite looking effect, but it's still going to have that light that the sun plays off of it when it goes outside. So this is going to look very accurate. I'm taking this piece of foam and I'm just running it along the edge and giving me a nice shoulder so when we spray this with glue we'll have a nice level shoulder on the side of the road. Just like that. And we'll paint this the rest of this off.
not very much green. This is pretty sparse. They still got a lot of rain there, but I'm using Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement to glue everything in place. This is permanent. Whatever you get it on, it doesn't come off of, so I'm prepared with wet rags to wipe the sides down. I'm going to go through about 16 ounces of material here, two bottles on this. It's not a very big diorama. Now that all the scenery has been glued, everything is drying right now, I didn't do the final scenery where the trestle's going to go. I'm going to put the bents in place where they belong. They should fit just right without any carving right now. I'll put the bents in place and when all the bents are glued in place, then I'll go back and I'll finish the gravel work on the shoulder work, the various areas where the trestle comes in where I just didn't want to put down a lot of dirt yet because I didn't want to mess up the fit that I've already got pre-carved out. So I'll take all these bents now and I'll start putting them all the way across on the trestle. A lot of today's work is going to be putting on the cross braces between the bents. It's going to take hours to do that. After that, the last thing to do would be to finish the highway girders and come through and finalize the scenery, like I said, come down more dirt, just a little more, just to finalize it, individual weeds. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to install this trestle. It's time to do that. fitting just perfectly into position here. Every one of them is dropping right into position and I haven't had to do any shaving to topography at all. Just a little liquid nail underneath and wood glue on top. And as you can see, this bridge is just dropping together. Everything's on center. Everything's lining up really nice. That's just about going to wrap this up. Just a couple more bents. Three more bents and I've got this thing all the way across. Set up now in a position where it's starting to look like a bridge. I'm cutting and measuring each individual board that goes in place on the trestle and then I'm notching out the bottom corners the bottom into squares so that the boards fit notched they'll settle down halfway into the uh, 12 by 12 so by cutting off this notch on the end of the of the piece of wood here you can see how it it works really well now this goes slow one piece at a time there's nothing fast about this but I've worked my way all the way across so far I've got all of these boards in and they're looking identical to the photographs in the books I'm not doing anything again without following the photographs exactly the way these cross braces go across so far it's looking pretty okay for the center spans here I simply took 
uh, larger uh, pieces of wood, dimensional lumber. I'll put it in the text what size this is. And I'm cutting them exactly to size so they fit in between the vents, just like that. And it looks really good. And then after that gets done, then this, this piece will fit right inside here perfectly and sit right in place once it's glued and that'll be just just perfect for that section right there in the middle right over where the creek goes underneath the bridge so there's nothing fast about this it's tedious one board at a time there's no magic to it you just gotta get through it and work your way all the way across your trestle just like I'm doing on this one here right now so I'll have this thing wrapped up probably in about six more hours best guess right now about six more hours and should be done okay it's taken a little bit more than six hours I'm actually a couple of days later here but I've managed to work all the cross braces now these running boards all the way across three and three and I'm continuing to cut and notch out new boards to put in over here I've got the sections for the girders cut and the right length to be placed underneath and I've got to tell you the road could be just a little off center on this and if it is I'm gonna rip up this road which is no big deal re-pour the concrete spend an extra two days getting it perfect not sure how that's gonna work out I'm checking the measurements actually I've got a good idea that it could be off by about a quarter of an inch not really that important to most folks but on this model I want it to look right so if I screwed up that part I'm gonna fix what's really cool right now is I wired up the track and I I've got our first passenger revenue run about the run across the bridge just because I couldn't stand not being able to watch a train run across this after all the time we've spent working on it. So it works, just not finished yet. Working on the girder section and finishing off a few more cross braces on the bridge. Additionally, you're going to start putting bolts across the top and you also drill four holes every 16 foot on center and put bolt, bolts on the side. That's something I'm really not in a hurry to do, but I will complete that task at some point on this process also. Here's another important process that I haven't explained, and this is rather unorthodox. This is not something that you can read into an article. I had to put all the nut and bolt castings onto the side of the deck and rather than drill holes on the existing bridge I was able to do this at the workbench now let me walk you through the process of what I essentially did uh, what I did was I took our existing deck and I laminated it with two additional pieces of wood of the same size by doing that I was able to cut each individual board one at a time and then sand them, make sure they fit precisely and centered over each truss. So in the event that your math didn't work and things didn't match up, this is a great way to cover up your mistakes. But after everything's been sanded and perfectly fit, I was able to take these pieces to the workbench, drill holes in them, and then take a little bit of white glue, dip it on the ends of the grant line castings, the bolts and nut washers, and then apply them to the boards and then once every one of them has been cut then I'm to the process of where I am now where I'm going to start gluing these on all the way across and it gives me the perfect width of my deck where the overhang of the ties is exactly the way we want it to be it looks prototypically accurate and matches the photographs so rather than again drilling all the holes into the bridge on the side part, which would have been very difficult to do without breaking drill bits, take it to the workbench, laminate the sides just like I did on this project. And so far it's coming out just right. Now in order to build the center steel section, I'm relying real heavily on the photographs in the Rio Grande Southern Stories, books 9 and books 10. And this is simply a project of following the photographs and making everything match. So I'm simply taking evergreen styrene, 14 uh, inch square I-beams, which is the best I can measure. That's what these are in the book. And I am building the, uh, actually these might be uh, 13 and a half, but I'm building the um, 
structure piece by piece. That's all you got to do is simply build it piece by piece. If you're building a prototype model like I'm doing, you just follow the photographs religiously and put the pieces in place. And in order to make these, I took microengineering girder sections. I painted them. I actually squared them off at an angle so that they're, they were all adjacent to each other at just a bit of an angle. And then I, I painted them silver. I trimmed them. I made sure everything fit just right. And then I started painting the uprights and then and then putting those into place. So a lot of different parts are getting painted silver right now and putting into place. And I'm using a combination of super glue and goo to glue these pay place these pieces in place. The goo is actually great because because on, on super glue the kicker usually affects silver paint and doesn't make it look so nice. So the goo holds up really well if you put if you're very uh, don't use a lot of it. It works great and it sets up fast. Okay, it's about six hours later, and I've got all the cross braces, all the girders, everything in place now the way it's supposed to be, and I'm going to have to paint this in place. So what I'm going to do is mask everything all the way around, pull out the airbrush, and very carefully spray this with a silver coat just to paint all the things that haven't been painted yet because it was built in place. But right now it's looking pretty good. Okay, I've essentially got the bridge done, and now I'm just finishing up the earth around the bottom of the bridge, the ballast line along the track, and I'm going to spray it all with a little Woodland Scenic Scenic, scenic Cement. I've got a uh, bucket full of water here with a wet rag in it so I can wipe down the sides in the event that I get glue on the sides. The last couple of things I do know I need to do on this after this glue dries tonight, other than pouring the creek with some resin, I need to run along the whole tops of the trestle and put in four bolts for each one of these 12 foot boards across the top. So there's a lot of bolts that need to be put in. There's no rush on that. This is gonna be a, an enjoyable project to take my time with. The other thing that I need to do, and it's gonna look really dramatic, it'll really add some, some neat look to this, is the Rio Grande Southern had uh, galvanized uh, tin that they put on top of each one of the trestle vents and I'm going to use aluminum foil for that, turn it on its dull side, let the dull side shine up. And that should, I've already experimented, that should look pretty good. I'll cut small pieces all exactly the same size and then wrap the tin around the tops of each one of these bets. And it should look pretty darn good. So now I'm going to start gluing this last bit and get it all finished here. The whole trestle can have glue on it, it's not going to hurt the wood, it's not going to hurt the stain, and it'll dry completely clear, so there's not going to be any issue. If anything else, it'll soak in and make it stronger. I do take the Q-tips and I wipe some of the heavy white off the top of the trestle where it shows, because that may dry white, and I don't want that to show up at all. It hasn't been really a problem. I'm putting it on very light so I don't blow the ground foam away. I'm getting a good soaking of glue on everything so that this is going to be bulletproof. Now in order to shoot the snow scene that I've got to shoot, the, the Robert Richardson photograph, I'm going to have to cover all of this beautiful scenery up with plaster to create the snow effect. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a garden hose when the shoot's done and I'm going to hose off this whole diorama. You got to figure it was wet when we built it, it's sealed with Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement, it's not going to hurt the wood, and that's the only effective way to get all of the plaster off after a photo shoot. It should look pretty darn good. So let's, let me soak everything real good here with glue, and this diorama will dry for about 48 hours, and she'll be ready to shoot. I've still also got to build the mountains that are going to go in the background behind the photograph, matching the mountains perfectly. I'll set the camera right up in here into position and trace those mountains onto a piece of foam, carve them out, color them correctly, and they'll be the background scenery that belongs in the shot from the camera angle that I'm shooting. So that's pretty much it for now. Let's see how this progresses. This is almost a completed diorama. Now that the bridge is done, it's time to pour our resin for the water and what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the resin on the scale and I'm going to turn it on and I'm going to pour the resin part A, part B into the cup, weigh it out so it's exactly the same. I built a clay dam on the edge here of the diorama that covers the top of the plywood so no resin's going to get on the plywood and this is going to be a very low water, low running creek so it'll be very easy to work this out and pour this next. Wow. 
pouring it on real easy. I'm going to let it feather out to the sides. I use a paintbrush and work it underneath the bridge. And this is just resin pouring 101. There's no magic to this. Follow the directions on the package. And the results are always good with this. Use a torch to get the air bubbles out midway through the project and don't burn the bridge down. Don't get any resin on the bridge. You'll play hell to get that off. This is nice. It's going to float back just right. Now you just touch the flame, just let it lick the top of the water, and it takes the air bubbles right out. Really quick. It's not the fire that does it, it's the, the gas from the fire that destroys the bubbles. I don't know how it works, but it's magic. Boom, they're all gone. They'll come back. I'll do this again, a second application, and notice the bridge isn't on fire, and that's a good thing. You don't want to superheat it too warm, because once this gets to 125 to 130 degrees, it'll start cooking all by itself, and it'll literally get hot and start bubbling and work its way out. I've seen it do it on larger river surfaces, where it starts out as two inches and it works its way out to 10 inches of superheated resin. It starts bubbling and fuming, and you need to get that out of the house because it's probably not good to breathe. But at this point, we're good. I'll do one more application with the torch, and the water is going to be done where the rocks are, where I want a little bit of white bubbles. We'll go back with some white paint. We'll figure the direction of the flow of the water, which I know is this way, and we'll make the appropriate bubbles and suds and the white effect on top of the water to give the effect of running water. For the background mountains on the bridge scene, I've traced the outline of the mountains exactly the way they are in the photograph. So that when this diorama is placed up over in front of the, behind the scene, this outline of the mountain ranges matches the prototype exactly. So that will have a good background match. Now it's a snow scene, so after I've got the darkened paint color here, I'm going to go over this with some white and just put an outline of white on this and allow the dark to show through so that it'll give the Apache snow effect that you get in the background of the mountain scene. And this will match the photograph to the background. So all I've got to really worry about now is creating the effect of cottony snow getting plowed off the trestle. If I pull that off, the whole shot's just going to fall together and we're going to get the photograph that we want, copying the Bob Richardson's famous photograph of 464 running across Lightner Trestle pulling the automotive loads back in 1952 in the early 50s. So that's the whole goal of the whole job, really, that's why we built the whole trestle, was for this photograph. And we're going to get there now. We're almost there. And this is where it all comes down. It's photo shoot days weeks and weeks of working on this bridge and now it's cut time to cover the whole thing up with plaster and recreate the Richard Robins Robertson shoot that we're about to do. All the building comes down to this very moment right now so let's see how this goes. Dude, this is coming out absolutely just right. Everything's lining up, the shadows look good, camera angle's good, and there's no wind right now. So everything's just perfect, and I know we got the shot. I know, just like that, we got the shot. A little Photoshop, and she's done. And that's how, that's how after two hours, or two hours of shooting, and uh, eight weeks of building this thing, it's finished. So. At that point, that's all there is. I hope you enjoyed this videotape. Thank you very much. Here we are at shoot day. This is a moment where it all comes down to all those months worth of work now get compiled into this very moment. Now we're reproducing the famous Robert Richardson photograph. And let me show you how it's laying out. 
I got cotton that I'm gonna blur out in Photoshop. Here's a shot just the way we want it set up. That's the snow shot. So now that we're done with this, it's time to clean this plaster off of this thing. So I'm gonna vacuum it up and garden hose off this puppy and get it all clean and back in the house. kids don't try this at home but this works you got to figure when we built this diorama we used water to build the entire thing everything's sealed the only way to get this plaster off is like this and it'll come right off it's not going to hurt the foam it's not going to hurt the wood everything's been sealed this is going to save you about an hour's worth of vac vacuuming Hey, the creek's flowing backwards. Now she's just going to dry. Everything's been sealed. The deck is sealed. This is not going to absorb water. This diorama is just fine. It's like being born all over again. So I just take it back in, and she's done. And as you can see, the trestle survived its bath. Everything worked out just great. And let me show you now, this is what the final photograph looked like. You can see the snow is being plowed by Locomotive 464 as it pushes the auto loads across the trestle. It's dusting, it's just falling around the girder section. Everything matches, the sun shadows matches. I think we've pretty much captured the Robert Richardson shot in this photograph and Blackstone Models is going to have a really nice Christmas card for the year 2014. To conclude this video, I want to follow up with the research material that I used in order to build Leitner Trestle. I relied heavily on Real Grand Southern's volume 9 and 10, the Real Grand Southern story from Sundance Books. You can find those, there's a 12 volume set of those, and you can find those available on eBay or check the Sundance website. They still have copies of various volumes available. A set like that can set you back almost $1,000, but it's worth the research material because it's invaluable. The drawings, everything for the entire Rio Grande Southern Railroad is in that book. Also, a lot of material I used came from other books. Um, Trails Along the Columbine, there's 10 volumes of that set of books. Robert Richardson did uh, a three set volumes of books, um, Chasing the Narrow Gauge, and volumes one and two cover the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad, and volume three, I use that volume heavily on this as well because that covers the Rio Grande Southern, and there's some beautiful shots in that book as well on Leitner Trestle. So with that, you, there's also a follow-up article that you can see in Kevin U. Daly's White River Publications. They bought the HON 30 Annual, edited by Chris Lane, and in that 2014 issue that's coming out, there will be a follow-up to the video and to the project of building Leitner Trestle and photographing it to get the final shot. So there's about 40 photographs in there, how-to pictures and text that explain in great detail, just like you saw in this video, how to go about building this bridge. So look for that. And with that, I'm, I want to say thank you for watching. That concludes this video on building Leitner Trestle. Thank you very much. For this segment of What's Neat, I've got Doug Blaine all the way from beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And being that this is the show that's running up to December 15th, this is considered our Christmas show. And with that, Doug, I understand that we're going to talk about a lot of wonderful Christmas offerings for the viewers out there. We are indeed. Good to be with you again, Ken. Yes, for Christmas uh, at Bachman, our saying is that your decorating is not done until there's a train under the tree. <laughs> so, so whether it's under the tree, on a tabletop, in a spare room, what have you, uh, we have the train for you. Fantastic. So without further ado, uh, please consider what we're going to show you for, for yourself for uh, as a gift. Um, always remember, it's great to get somebody started in model railroading. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of reaching and uh, grabbing for train sets, what have you. So excuse me if my back's 
uh, are up off, off screen for a little bit, but here's our first offering. This is a standard in our line. This is the night before Christmas large scale train set. I'm gonna try and get it all in frame. Nice. This is fabulous for under the tree. And just a great presence, a great size. It's got the 460 steam locomotive and tender, operating headlight, battery operated steam chuff, speed synchronized, uh, coal load, and it's got a hopper, kids can put presents in it to run them around the tree, and uh, a classic caboose. That's absolutely so that's, beautiful. That's what we're gonna start with for under the tree. Of course, any of this works for under the tree. Um, and I'm gonna be jumping back and forth a little bit between train sets and separate sale. But to continue in the large scale vein here, here is our large scale, this is a separate sale locomotive. Uh, also a 460, and there we go. That same, is beautiful. Same features as the uh, as the one in the sets, except this one in separate sale has all metal valve gear and side side rods. It's got metal gears as well. Nice. So it's just an impressive looking locomotive. Great size. Takes some knocks. The uh, animals can uh, paw at it, and and you'll be fine. <laughs> All right, let's see. So we're going to move to ON30 now, O scale narrow gauge. I've got a couple of sets to show you there. This one is our Norman Rockwell set. Beautiful. This is a com complete ready to run train set. Train, track, power pack. Um, Norman Rockwell, great Norman Rockwell graphics on it. Let's see what's under here. Nice. Another, th this has the uh, nickel silver rail uh, with gray road bed. And uh, about a, let's see, about a three by three by five track layout, operating headlight, what have you. Great graphics for Norman Rockwell. Classic Christmas scenes. I can vouch also, for that one. We've got that one here in the studio. Um, I should excellent. have brought it down and put it on the table. Also in Owen 30 is this is a reversing trolley set. Okay. So this is a point to point system. The streetcar goes back and forth. You can control the speed. It has a variable stop sign, or a stop time, rather, um, and a great uh, engine house to go back into when you're, when you're all, all done for the evening. So, but because this is point to point, it works um, on a mantle. Yes. Uh, so it gives you a, another option for a train in a space that you wouldn't normally think you could run it. Uh, run um, a train and enjoy some Christmas scenery. Also great for Christmas buildings, yes. the ceramic building sets like Department 56. Um, that last set was electric. This one I'm showing you right now is another Norman Rockwell set. This is also a streetcar set, but this one is battery operated. Very beautiful. And I know who did so, that photography. <laughs> Gee, I wonder who that might have been, Mr. <laughs> Ken Patterson. And you're right, it is beautiful photography. Thank you. So again, battery-operated point-to-point system. So moving on to more HO scale, or more sets. These are HO scale. This is uh, our Jingle Bell Express. This has been in the line for, for a while. Great colors. Looks, it looks like Christmas. It does. And um, anyone would be excited to find that under the tree for a present. Yes. All right. And then I'm going to show you a new set. It's not in just yet. It should be in by the end of this month. This is our uh, another Norman Rockwell set. Nice. There we go. So that'll be in stock by uh, mid-November for sure. Sh should be the end of this month or definitely by mid-November. Right, that's when this video will be coming out. Oh, perfect, timing is excellent. So again, classic Rockwell illustrations on that set. And then also, we would be remiss for with not showing our HO scale Thomas set. This is uh, Thomas Saves Santa Sleigh, or Thomas Saves, yeah, Santa Sleigh. And uh, this has a custom Thomas Sleigh on it and uh, Thomas with a snowplow. Of course, with our Thomas sets, the HO scale, the eyes move back and forth as it goes down the track, so that's some great animation for the kids. And um, just a, a nice, fun set as well, and a brake van on the back. Nice, Doug, that's beautiful. Thank you. 
All right. Now we have some N scale sets. This is uh, called the Spirit of Christmas. This is a passenger set. Okay. There we go there. Nice passenger set with a uh, steam locomotive. Great for smaller spaces, of course, tabletops. And then we have uh, a freight set, also with a steam locomotive. Again, great for the smaller spaces. I don't have to tell you that for N scale. Right. But um, for decorating opportunities, it just expands if you want to use this strictly as a decoration and not as a, you know, a, a, a full modeled railroad. You've got all the bases covered in all the scales. Absolutely. I'd also like to share with you, Ken, our line of separate sale products um, in all scales as well. So one of our first item, uh, going back to large scale, I'm gonna work my way down then. Uh, I already showed you the 460 locomotive. This one is in our, our just our fun egg liner uh, offerings. And this is obviously a, a, the Christmas egg liner. It's got a nice Santa sleigh on the top with a, a Merry Christmas greeting. Nice. These have operating uh, flashing headlights and marker lights as well. So from large scale, we have the same in O gauge three rail. Okay. There we go. Same top. Nice. Also with operating uh, headlights and marker lights. And then also in O gauge three rail, is uh, this utility vehicle with a headlight and it's got a flashing roof light which with a familiar uh, red nose there. That's a beautiful little speeder. I love it. Yeah. Nice and fun. All right. Then from O gauge uh, three rail, we'll go to ON30. Uh, of course, two rail as well. We have our uh, 260 locomotive. This is not the exact one we have for separate sale. I apologize, but it's similar. Um, to see the exact one, please do check out our website, uh, BachmanTrains.com. Don't forget the double N in Bachman. Trains is plural. And um, there, oops, sorry. That's beautiful, man. We put, so, one, we put one of those in the cover of Mainline Modeler in the very late... 90s, early 2000s when you first came out with the Christmas set and I weathered that thing up and it looks so realistic and so beautiful. It doesn't look like a Christmas locomotive. It just looks like a very beautiful painted locomotive. Excellent. Yes, that's uh, it, uh, that's always one of my favorite locomotives. I think it's a, it is a beauty. All right. And then let's see, we have, these are some streetcars again in Owen 30. Okay. Um, Nice. This says these greetings. It's got the uh, trolley pole that comes up, spring loaded. And then new for this year, we have um, uh, a Merry Christmas version. Very nice. Also with a trolley pole, lighted interior, also headlamps as well. So that's available separately. Moving to um, HO scale. We have our uh, two our 060 locomotive. There we go. Nice, nice colors. This is standard line, um, operating headlight with the bandy tender. Nice. Sorry, slope back tender. All right. Again, in HO scale, we have another. Another piece of motive power. This is a classic in our line. It's been around forever, our Gandhi Dancer. Yes. So with a pumping action for both Santa and an elf, can get that zipping around the track. Kids love that one. We have two. We have a box car and a stock car. This is our Claus Candy Cane Company car. It's got the operating door, of course. So you can add that onto a set, add it onto the separate sale locomotive. Uh, we have a stock car in HO scale. This one is in our, uh, most of these uh, pieces that I'm showing you are in our, have our North Pole and Southern logo, um, which is our trade trademark Christmas um, railroad name. Nice. These have the, uh, the reindeer popping in and out of the doors, <laughs> the windows as it goes around the track. That's nice, fun action. And lastly, last but not least, is our N-scale separate sale locomotive. 
right there. Terry, very nice, Doug. I'm so impressed at the amount of various models that you have to help our modelers out there, our viewers, share the joy of Christmas. It, that's our goal. And um, as I, I mentioned, we didn't show everything. There are some things. Uh, everything I showed you is in stock or will be in stock by the, um, by the time the show airs. Uh, there are additional items that um, will be coming into stock. So, again, please do check our website at BachmanTrains.com. Share your enthusiasm. Share the spirit of Christmas with these great railroading offerings. And uh, we, we hope you will enjoy them. Absolutely so true. I want to thank Lombard Hobbies out of Lombard, Illinois, for helping us support this show and all the items that you have seen you can order through Lombard Hobbies. Doug, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. A pleasure indeed, Ken. All right, thank buddy. You for, uh, th thank you. Let me wish you and yours a very Merry Christmas, Doug. And to you and to yours and to everyone watching. Thank you. That is awesome. And that it concludes this segment for What's Neat. All the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at BachmanTrains.com.